Welcome to this fourth video in the ocean series. Today we're going to focus on tides and shoreline stabilization. The learning targets for this video are to describe the factors that influence tides, to evaluate shoreline erosional problems and solutions, including man's influence on both the problem and the solution, and to compare the relationship between sea level and sediment deposits. Let's focus our attention on tides first. Tides result from the gravitational attraction between the Earth and the Moon and, to a lesser extent, the Sun. Tides depend on the location of each of those three bodies. In the top diagram on the left side, we see a new Moon where the Moon and the Sun and the Earth are aligned as they're shown here, and that forms that tidal bulge around the equatorial regions. Similar situation with a full moon, where the moon is on the opposite side of the Earth. So these are called spring tides. And in a spring tide, we have higher high tides and lower low tides. And that produces a greater difference between the high tide high and the low tide low. In the diagram on the right side, we see an example of the first quarter and the third quarter here. And this shows us that the tidal bulge is not as great when the alignment between the Sun, Earth, and Moon is at 90 degrees. And that produces what we call a neap tide. In a neap tide, high tide is slightly lower than normal, and low tide is slightly higher than normal, and that produces a lower tidal variation from high to low tide. Tidal cycle is about 29 days. Now turning to talking about tidal patterns and tidal currents. There are three different types of tidal patterns. The first is called diurnal. In a diurnal tidal pattern, we have one high tide and one low tide per day. And you can see an example of a diurnal tide at the bottom diagram here. In a semi-diurnal tide pattern, we have two high and two low tides per day. And the high is about the same and the lows are about the same. So you see an example of a semi-diurnal tide pattern in the top diagram. In the center diagram, we see an example of a mixed tide pattern where there are still two high and two low tides per day, but the highs are not equal in height and the lows are not equal in height. In between those highs and lows, we have tidal currents that move water in or out. So if the tide is rising, we would call that a flood current. And if the tide is falling or going out, we would call that an ebb current. Looking now to thinking about stabilizing shorelines. So we have hard stabilization of shorelines. These are structures that are built to protect coastlines from erosion and from sand movement. We'll talk about three of them here. First, we'll talk about groins. Groins are structures that are built at right angles to the coastline and they're built to trap sand that's moving via long shore transport. We can see in this top picture examples of a groin field. So we have several groins that are built along this coastline to protect it from long shore transport and from moving the sediment along the shore. Secondly, we can talk about breakwaters. Breakwaters are built parallel to the shoreline and they're built to reduce the impact of waves. In the picture here at the bottom, you see several, in this picture you can see five of them, breakwaters that have been built parallel to the shoreline. What you'll notice is that the wave action has been reduced so much behind those breakwaters that there is significant deposition. So you can see sand bulges forming, and you can see some sand deposition in the areas directly between the breakwater and those sand bulges. And finally, seawalls. Seawalls are common here in South Florida, and we have an example of this one along Biscayne Bay that is basically armoring the coastline against the impact of waves. So what are some alternatives to hard stabilization measures? Well, primary alternative is beach nourishment. Beach nourishment is simply adding large quantities of sand back into the beach system. The sand that's added might be dredged from just offshore, or it might be trucked in from an alternate location. In the situation of beach nourishment, it typically has to be repeated many times because the erosional processes are still at work. There have also been studies indicating that beach nourishment damages ecosystems. Secondly, in some locations, they are actually changing land use. So an example of this is parts of Staten Island shown in the bottom picture. 
that have been turned into parks. They were previously residential areas following the impact of Superstorm Sandy. And we might want to rethink some of these land use changes as sea levels continue to rise. Finally, looking at transgressive and regressive sequences. So shorelines migrate landward or seaward in response to sea level changes, and those produce transgressive in the case of onshore movement or sea level rise, or regressive in the case of sea levels falling. The top picture shows a transgressive situation. So sea level here is rising, and as it rises, the coarser materials will be deposited further and further inland with sea level moving further inland. In a regressive sequence, offlap, sea level is rising, the coastline is moving offshore further and further, and that would mean that the coarser materials will continue to move offshore as sea level declines. So I think we're ready to take a look back at our learning targets here. We described the factors that influence tides. We evaluated shoreline erosional problems and solutions and we compare the relationship between sea level and sediment deposits. Go ahead and take your Master Check quiz, and I'll see you in class.